Okay, we're going to focus this video on art and literature and how Renaissance art, which you guys are very, very familiar with, um, but I want to go into a little bit more to show you a few examples, and then in class we'll look at the art a little bit more uh, in depth. But I do want to show you some examples, some artists, and why art happened this way. But definitely why art fl uh, flowers is obviously one, you have patrons buying it. You have people wanting art, and you want them to uh, see something very realistic. For example, one artist we're not going to talk about, but I want to mention now, is the artist Giotto. Uh, he's probably the earliest Renaissance artist who can actually paint in what is called uh, perspective, making something look 3D on a 2D surface. Um, and when he is found, he is painting a lamb on a rock, and the master artist who takes him in is so amazed at what he does that, you know, Giotto becomes so good he surpasses him, uh, almost to the point where on one of the paint, uh, paintings that the master artist is doing, he's painting a one of his patrons, and Giotto comes in to play a joke and paints a fly on the master's painting's nose, and the master artist thinks it's a real fly and actually tries to wipe it away over and over again until he ruins his painting, um, which is ironic obviously there, but it was so realistic that he could not uh, believe his own eyes. So, you know, with the patrons and with this new perspective of art and with the amount of money being spent on art, art's really going to really grow here in this time period. So, first thing with art, it definitely reflects humanistic thought, okay? There's definitely a revival in the ages, bringing back this realism. I mean, the art in Rome and the art in... Greece was very realistic, okay? And but the the difference here though is that as they revive the ancient way of art and they look at how art is going to be more realistic, it's also bringing in many religious themes into the time period. What we're going to see with a lot of art is religious ideas like the Virgin Mary, like the baby Jesus, uh religious ideas brought into a modern day. They're going to be put into a Renaissance perspective even though they are an ancient or a religious symbol. So that's going to be a big part of humanist thought is making again the individual aware of their own surroundings, okay? And this happens through the art as well. Uh, you know, you're going to get life-size sculptures. The famous sculptor Donatello is going to build life-size sculptures for his patrons. For example, he builds the horse and the soldier on horseback. I mean, it is the size of a regular horse uh, and the size of a regular man. You can see the fine detail uh, from the hooves to the expressions, the way the horse's head is turning, to the facial express expressions, to the hair on the tail, and the way it's wrapped up, to all even the very fine details of the soldier himself. I mean, this is very difficult work to do, um, but very well done, and it was very well respected at a time period. And other artists are going to do exactly the same thing. Like I said, you have perspective, which is a new art technique, and this is the use of real, realism, making uh, linear perspective, making the eye drawn in not just what is art, but in beauty uh, to a certain spot on the painting that opens the whole painting up. When I show you Raphael and the idea of the School of Athens, there is a point to which people are drawn to, and then the whole painting opens wide open. And the same thing goes with Brunelleschi's uh, El Duomo. He's going to use linear perspective to bring everyone to a point as they're looking at his dome of Florence. Okay? In the architecture, it's beauty and utility. It's looking right and looking beautiful, but also being functional. Okay? And this goes again back to what the Romans and what the Greeks did. You know, the, the columns and the... Um, triangular shaped facades, the domes and arches. This is all going to come back into its architecture, okay? Uh, these ideas are going to become even better during the Renaissance. Like I said, Il Duomo, Burleski's Il Duomo in Florence, St. Peter's Basilica has a major dome on it. I mean, these are all going to be inspirations for the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., you know, the columns that are in front of the Supreme Court building. These are all ideas brought from the Greeks and Romans through the Renaissance into the modern day. Okay, and we'll look at Brunelleschi's Il Duomo on the Cathedral of Florence. They actually thought that this was going to collapse. All right, It's the highest structure in all of Florence, so wherever you are in the city, you can see Il Duomo. Okay, The next thing is it's octagonal, which is very rare. And again, this comes back from the Muslim idea, the Islamic idea of using uh, mathematics to build architecture. If you notice here, he has spines on the side. There are eight spines on the inside and the outside that are supporting this structure. Um, and of course, on the inside of Il Duomo, it is painted with religious art. So, you know, it, it stands above and beyond the, the artistic qualities, the artistic beauty of the time period, but it really shows the innovation and the technology that these artists had. 
All right. Obviously, we look at Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, he is a master of the arts, and we know this. He is the true Renaissance man. He is the one who was able to speak correctly. He could write. He was a poet. He was a scientist. He was a mathematician. He was a painter. He was a sculptor. You know, he studied cadavers. I mean, this guy was as well-rounded as can be, and really, you know, was able to adapt his styles to all the different patrons that he was hired for. All right. Um, because of his use with cadavers, and, and really he says in, in, in one of the documents you may get for the honors group for their project, it shows the breakdown of, of the shoulder of the human body and how the ligaments and the tendons and the muscles and the bone structure and what it looks like when the arm moves. I mean, really breaking down the body itself to make his art, his sculptures and his painting much more realistic. Okay, and it makes a difference if you know how the body operates. If you understand how your body operates or how a body operates, it makes painting so much easier. I mean, look here at his own portrait. This is a self portrait that he painted without any reflection of mirror. He just knew what he looked like, he understood how his body was, and he was able to paint that and depict that in his own self portrait here. Okay, uh, extremely multi talented artist, writer, sculptor, poet, inventor. I mean, we can go on and on and on about Da Vinci and what he did, but I really want to focus on his art and what it looks like. Okay, so obviously, his most famous piece of art is the Mona Lisa. Now, they uh, recently I read they excavated some bones um, from a mid 16th century woman that they believe to be the Mona Lisa. Okay, obviously, the importance here is uh, what is she smiling at? What is a smirk? What is she looking at? You know, who is she? And we, we come to find out she really is a patron's wife uh, who had been married a few times and wanted to paint her in a light. But, you know, she's not overly gorgeous. She's not overly beautiful. Um, but she is very, very kind of unassuming. What is going through her mind as she sits there? And if you notice, you can tell the perspective uh, of where she's sitting in a chair in front of a, probably on a balcony or in front of a window that overlooks looks the countryside that she lives in and in the distance you can see the river that flows you can see the, the trees in the background the mountain range you can see one of the Roman aqueducts going past in the background here you can see the veil on her head uh, you know she has her arms crossed across her stomach uh, and her hands are a little swollen so is this woman pregnant at the time you know these are all questions that have been asked about uh, the Mona Lisa. There's also a belief that when Da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa um, through high resolution cameras that this painting is him uh, in a lot of ways. They've come to find out possibly later that it's not. Uh, but what is she smirking at? Why is it so kind of interesting and um, so kind of mysterious in her art in the art and we'll talk about that a little bit more in class uh, another famous one is the last supper of course and like i told you before now this is a print of it in the true last supper you would notice a doorway underneath jesus's feet because this is in a monastery's cafeteria they wanted the monks to look up at jesus and the disciples at the last supper and reflect and pray while they're having their lunch or their dinner and of course it groups what da vinci does here is he groups the disciples in groups of three and you can notice different emotions that are going on amongst the groups of three as you have this very very calm and cool and collect jesus christ now what i want you to take notice here is um all of them are wearing what would be considered Renaissance time period clothing in a very Renaissance time period building. This would not have been the Last Supper of Jesus Christ, um, but again, it's it's bringing the ancient religious world into the more modern day. And again, we'll discuss more about this when we look at it in class. Um, the Vitruvian Man, okay, the study on science. Now, this is him. Okay, and you notice he has the body in what would be a perfect circle where the body has to move versus the square, uh, proportions of bodies. A lot of artists of this day, they're going to build their churches uh, in reference to the human body and how the human body works and, and where the church should be larger and where it should be smaller. Um, but his study on the body, you can see what the foot like, looks like open with the calf and how it turns when the foot turns up the circle, how it changes here. Same thing with the wrists, the uh, forearms, the shoulders, the biceps, the thighs, 
All right, his facial expressions, if his head were to turn, and of course, all studied and written down. If you notice, his writing is actually backwards. To read Da Vinci's writing, you had to read it in a mirror to understand it. As one way, he kept himself from being somebody taking his ideas. Um, da Vinci is also known to have written uh, in both directions and with both hands. He was able to write with two hands at the same time, two completely separate sentences. So you're talking about an extremely intelligent man that was well above and beyond anyone else in society. All right, and then his inventions. Here is a mill, a water wheel mill for grinding. He invented a tank. He invented a, an early form of a helicopter, um, a machine gun. I mean, we're talking about massive military inventions. And really, da Vinci is going to be known for helping Cesare Borgia uh, build new inventions to attack cities on Borgia's conquests throughout Italy. And we'll look at da Vinci, a video on da Vinci a little bit later. All right, Michelangelo, not Michelangelo, but Michelangelo, another obviously very famous Renaissance artist of the day. All right, multi-talented once again. He is known more for being a sculptor. However, he's going to be very famous for his paintings as well. Uh, but again, more, very multi-talented, not quite to the extent of da Vinci when it comes to what he was multi-talented in. But again, he studied bodies. He definitely paid attention to the fine details of a cadaver. He understood what the sculpture was supposed to look like. Um, and he did write a little bit, uh, but... Michelangelo is much, much different than da Vinci here, okay? He is called the melancholy genius, okay? His work represents spiritual and artistic struggles. A really big spiritual struggle for Michelangelo was that he was the artist of the church. The church was the patron for him, um, and that he was a homosexual. So he was really struggling with his beliefs on how he lived his life um, as a person, but also his religious life because he was a very devout Catholic in a very difficult time for homosexuality to be around. Uh, Michelangelo really struggled there, okay? And of course, this is shown through his artistic struggles, you know, trying to get the perfect piece of marble, the perfect sculpture, the perfect painting, um, and actually doing a lot of work like the Sistine Chapel that he didn't want to do, but made beautiful anyway because that's what he had to do. And his work really shows his sadness. I mean, if you look at his own self-portrait or his self-drawing here, his sketching, you can see the sadness on his face and the kind of distraught of Michelangelo. All right, he's a Roman Catholic Church's main artist, which I did mention, and we'll look at his art. Now, the first one is the David, okay? And this David is massive. It stands, I believe, roughly about seven or eight feet tall, but it is a perfect rendition of David, the slayer of Goliath in the Old Testament. Now, Florence wanted this built because they wanted to show a statue to kind of get people behind the city as it looked to defend itself, defend its republic. And here is a statue of David before he is going to go slay Goliath. And that one represents the protection that Florence is going to give for its people. But if you notice the very fine details of his hair, his muscles, even some other parts of his body to his hands is very, very well done. And supposedly it's been sculpted from a perfect piece of marble. Well, again, we'll get into this more when we get to class. The Pieta, and this sits inside of the Vatican. And it's not a very big sculpture in the grand scheme of St. Peter's Basilica in the actual church. It's a very small sculpture, but you can see Michelangelo's sadness here as it's the moment that Christ has been removed from the cross and he's laying in his mother's arms after he has died. And you can see the melancholy on her face with this very lifeless body of Jesus that is now in her arms. But again, the very fine details, the very fine details that are in the Pieta are so important. All right, next piece of art is obviously the Sistine Chapel. All right, you're talking about a, the, it was going to be the Pope's personal chapel. And this is where they actually vote for the Pope with the College of Cardinals is inside the Sistine Chapel. But you can see uh, all the stories of the Old Testament are painted up on the walls on the ceilings, in the corners, obviously the most famous one being this one here in the middle where it is man reaching up to touch God, it is God reaching down to give life to man, to wake him out of his slumber, and how they're almost coming together in the middle, but they haven't quite got there yet. But what's even more amazing is obviously the fine details of what man and God look like, but the idea that he put this inside of a perfect rendition of a human brain, and that the the brain and the, the thought of God and the power of God that comes from the brain is reaching down to man who is almost lifeless, trying to kind of become something, shows great um, 
awareness of religion and faith, but also artistic quality um, that goes on there. And again, we'll look at the Sistine Chapel a little bit more in detail later. All right, he was also instrumental in helping build St. Peter's Basilica, and you can see the style, the domes, the columns, and the arches that are there.